Okay. Thanks a lot, Alice, for the invitation. We are very happy uh, and honored to speak here about our work tonight. Ten years ago, in 2013, we established the Office Schneider Turcher in Zurich. We had the chance to start with a direct commission. When we look back on these years, we noticed that our first project, a residential building with five units, is our largest realized project until today. Since then, projects became smaller. Could you take down that light a bit? It's really good. Thank you. This contradicts a bit the growth theory of capitalism, but for us, as a starting point for today's lecture, this fact seems interesting. In a way, we use this preparation of this lecture to reflect the way we practice. So we would like to talk about what we do, we try to explain why we do it, and we dig deeper into how we do it. We are interested in the processes within our practice, because on our tools and methods, we have the greatest influence. Here we can define priorities and navigate them if necessary. And this is also where the term form comes into play. The title of the lecture series, After Form, kept us thinking. Of course, we can relate to it, to the current and very necessary paradigm shift. But we still see form as a central element with which we, architects in our daily business, communicate and express ideas and concepts of living together. So we used the working title Beyond Form and had no better idea until today, so we kept it. To give you an idea of our approach, we would like to show you, after this short introduction, three projects in detail. They represent different issues we are dealing, sometimes struggling with, as a practice of today. The first topic is Umbau, the transformation of existing. Most of our projects are small, and most of them are based on a very dominant given structures, physically but also socially. The second theme is process in which the projects are embedded. Dealing with a real building culture, not the highly sophisticated Swiss architecture is probably famous for, forces us to improvise throughout the whole process. And the third topic, a kind of overall topic, is the dichotomy between the ideal and the real. We are facing fundamental problems we have to deal with, environmental, and, also, and consequentially, also social problems. It is not very hard to formalize ideal values from an isolated point of view, but how do we apply them to the reality of a practice? A reality where architecture is embedded in a quite complex network of interests, where it plays just a marginally powerful role. We are interested in this ambivalence and do not want to avoid it and hide in an ideal niche. So we are constantly mediating between the real and the ideal. Ideal, so to speak, the pure for us would be that our work is part of a system with a social agenda, reacting on the housing shortage, the care topic, or another agenda with a social relevance. It would also be that our work draws as much as possible on the existing, physically and socially, and consequently that our work understands itself always as an intervention in something already existing, not as a creation from scratch. The ideal would be that we always find the smallest necessary degree of intervention, a maxim formulated by the sociologist Lucius Burkhardt in the 80s. We very much agree with the smallest possible intervention, how he calls it, according to him, consists first of all in understanding an existing situation aesthetically. Understanding changes our perceptions. Therefore, it is already an intervention. On the left side, you see an example relating to this topic he shows in his book, a work by Paul Armand Getty, who transformed Castle into a botanical garden by simply naming the found plants. And on the right side, a survey drawing for a project that we'll show you in a bit. Observing, measuring, and drawing changed our perception regarding the structure, how it appears today, but also 
revealed the layers of history. Thus, is thus it gave us an idea on social circumstances of today, and it embedded and enabled us to speculate what was going on in the past. To come back to the idea of the ideal, it would be wonderful and ideal if we could always afford a deep engagement with the given before we even think of how touching it. But both examples also show that a real engagement with the found automatically confronts us with the reality. And reality is not pure and not isolated. We are dealing with ordinariness. We deal with clients, with building regulations, with politics in a bigger sense. We struggle with communication and with craftsmanship. We have to deal with external but also internal economy and so on. What we try to do is to keep an equilibrium of different forces in balance. And we accepted that we face two different modes of working, reacting to the real and the ideal. We improvise and we compose. While composition is very present in, theor in theory of architecture, especially in a historical dimension, However, improvisation not, and if at all, then, it, then in a rather unpopular way, in the sense of not very well crafted, at least in the German language. I start with how we understand composition, the more obvious mode of working in our profession. We believe that architects, even in today's circumstances, must be able to formalize, give form to ideas, that means to establish precise relationships between dimensions, forms, elements, spaces, etc. We cannot avoid composing, even if a lot is predefined. To compose in our case comes primarily with drawing and model making. It is a concentrated, precise and slow act of searching. Composition as an approach is exclusive, objective, and concentrated. It isolates, sorts, and creates. Composing could also be read as the ideal, but as we already heard, the ideal never comes without the reality, at least in our practice. While working with the existing, physically and socially, one encounters always a certain degree of imprecision, and the unexpected can always occur. Then we have to improvise. There is no point in trying to ignore that. When one works with ordinary building culture, this mode of working is very necessary. Improvisation as an approach is inclusive, subjective, and dispersive. It integrates, collects, and perceives. But how can we cultivate the improvisation? This is a question that concerns us a lot. Answering this would solve a lot of problems. Getting closer to the term has already pointed us in a fruitful direction. This quote from jazz musician and composer Soray Tichon, I hope I spelled it right, showed us a different possible reading. He says in an interview with a German newspaper, everything is composition, whether something is planned or spontaneously composed. composed. That's the whole difference. But actually, it's not. Composition, to use the traditional terms, is slowed down improvisation. And improvisation, to me, is accelerated composition. And this suggests that we should not try to understand composing and improvising as two different methods or concepts of performing. It's only an actual a matter of time. We can assume that improvisation is much more based on interaction but still is dependent on a common composed structure, knowledge or language. Without this pattern, it would be noise, or in architecture, a mess. And this pattern, or baseline, leaves more or less space in between, where temperaments and individualities can unfold. We think it's a beautiful thought that we, as architects, could offer this space without losing the vision of the qualities that are superior to it. We are sure that architecture as a practice could benefit from this acceptance of improvisation. 
This would free us from the pressure of having to influence everything. We would actually save time, so to say it could be a win-win situation. And obviously we could socially involve during the process of projecting and building. But how do we define that open structure which allows a project to gain quality from improvisation? We don't have a formula yet, and there's probably, there probably isn't one. That's maybe also the secret of improvisation. But with positive and negative experiences, we are trying to get closer to a method that includes these aspects, this reality in a design. What we usually do is to define a basic formal idea which, is strong, which strongly draws from the knowledge of the existing situation in all its dimensions. We usually formalize them by a conscious isolation. We do that with very, very different kind of medias, with the goal of finding a kind of pattern. We deliberately use the friction of the tool and the medium for this isolation. It forces us to stay concentrated and not being distracted. While doing this, we use simple means in order to be fast and economic. Best case, we end up with a simple piece of work which accompanies us during the remaining process. A kind of comparative piece with which we can check the re respective status of the project. A while ago, we were asked why our lines in our projects are so short or getting shorter. We thought about this and reflected on the process from initial drawing to project completion, built or not. They are indeed getting shorter and shorter, which of course also has to do with this aspect of improvisation. And often our clients and we cannot afford the long lines, the big gestures. We are actually constantly reacting formally to external influences. But we hope that the original structure, the spatial idea of the project will withstand this process and that our work will not become noise or a mess. Now we'd like to show you three projects we did in the last few years. We tried to prepare this pre presentation in order to give an impression of the processes behind. I'm now going to show you the project of Berg, the left one, which is actually two projects. And Michaela will show you the projects Hall in the middle and Elephant on the right. What they have in common is that all of them are transformations of existing ext or extensions of existing buildings. They are situated in the Alpine region, but in different countries. Auf Bellwerk is a dwelling project in Liechtenstein and is executed. Hall is also a dwelling project, but in Austria. And we are still working on it, although under special conditions. You will hear about that later. And Elephant was a competition for extension of a school into a church in Zurich. We did not win, unfortunately. So I start with the project of Berg. It is an extension of a farmhouse into its attached stable barn and beyond. It's situated in the Rhine Valley on a small hill, you see it in the back, in Liechtenstein, but very close to the border to Austria. And the Rhine here is the border to Switzerland. The clients approached us with the idea to extend their living space in, in the spatially generous barn as a contrast to the very rigid and tight existing house they inhabited back then, this house. The main program was a new generous kitchen and dining working space with a strong connection to the existing kitchen garden. In order to be able to split the units if necessary, they also wanted a new bathroom and a separate toilet. And some interior storage space was also on the list. And finally, since the existing technical equipment of the house was very, very low tech, they needed a new room for new equipment for the whole house, heating, etc. We worked on this from 2016 until 2020. Actually, we made two projects. Until 2018, we worked on Aufberg 1, 
But then the client couple split the budget as well, so we had to start the project again. I show you both projects since at least the knowledge about the existing and the knowledge about the client was possible to transfer to the second project. The biggest challenges in these projects, which often forced us to improvise, were the changing client constellations, but also the emo emotional relationship of the remaining client to the existing building, which was her parents, grandparents' house. But also the fact that the client lived in the old house during the entire process, which sometimes led, for instance, to direct communication on site we were not involved in. And of course, the main challenge was the rather complex ex existing structure, which was to be touched as little as possible due to the great economic pressure. Here you can see what we found on site. The picture on the left is actually not very different from today's condition. A simple farmhouse with an attached stable barn, very common typology in this region. There is a front yard which gives access to two other buildings you don't see here. There is one here. And a quite generous garden with a big tree in the middle and a beautiful view towards the Alpine Rhine Valley. The building date origins back to the middle of the 19th century and it has been regularly adapted to new needs since then. As you can see, especially on the interior images, adaptations have always been executed very pragmatically. Purely vernacular, with a lot of room for improvisation, but still one en an entity. Something we were, we were, but still are, very interested in and try to learn from. We approached the building in the very beginning with a survey of the existing structure. These drawings were the base for the first CAT drawings and the big model we mainly used to develop the idea of the first project. We deliberately did this in this way and not, let's say, with a point cloud survey. It forced us to, uh, to translate the very complex geometries of the existing into a simpler language we were able to go on working with. The lower plants show the ground floor and the upper plants the first floor. The drawings on the left orange show the dwelling part. On the right, you see the stable barn and the later attached structures. The structure of the dwelling is based on a four square plan, better visible on the drawing here. A simple cross wall constellation divides the space into four main spaces. The heat source, the oven, and the stove on the on the ground floor, the chimney on the upper floor is placed in the center where the walls intersect. This typology is very common in this area. This part of the conglomerate is mainly made in natural stone masonry, timber floors and a timber roof. Attached on the right side of the dwelling in the north, the stable barn. The timber post and beam structure partly clad cladded divides the plan into three parts. There is this part, this part, and this one. The first, the big space going through the building to enter and exit it with vehicles. It marks the center of the conglomerate with relationship to the dwelling, the front yard, and the garden. This space was very important to the clients, so they insisted on a good translation of it for the conversion. Second, the middle part, with a former pig stable, a bit lower in section, and a workshop, mainly for wood, towards the garden. And the third one, a space to park vehicles, and a chicken stable, also towards the garden. And there are two extensions, one to the north and one towards the garden, which was actually not in a good shape. Uh, so that was the only part we had to um, dismantle. The first thing we did after the initial survey was to build a model of the existing. 
It was at the beginning mainly to understand the existing structure in all three dimensions. But it was, all, but it, but it was also not a translation or isolation of the given. We built models in our space in Zurich and we tried to be as independent as possible so we can cut as much as possible by hand on our, our tables. We use very simple model materials, usually a mix of things we have at hand, cardboard, corrugated cardboard, also from packaging or paper. To be able to concentrate in the beginning on very basic qualities, space elements, dimensions, the composition, we like to paint the models. It also hides the imprecise, which is also a kind of improvisation. And we can highlight specific elements or formal relations with a small range of different colors. As I said, it was an approach to understand the existing. Then it became a tool of design. It was, a kind, of our, it was kind of our own table fitting building site for the whole designing process of the first project. We built, we changed, we adapted, we repaired, and we painted it again. And doing so, it always reminded us of what we are dealing with, an existing structure. These photographs show the first draft of the project, so to say. The idea was to change the whole stable barn into an extension of the existing house, which is indicated in the, mo in the model. This will be the existing house. The volume should stay almost as we found it. We just added two big and one small dormer to make the top level usable and to bring light into the space below the roof. The generous open space inside should be kept as far as possible. It should complement the dense structure of the existing house. To access the different levels and to equip the kitchen, we worked with a strategy of introducing kind of independent figure contrasting the given structure of the barn. We saw them as the first inhabitants, similar to this early piece of Alberto Giacometti, which was a kind of impulse for this idea of specific figures within a rather generic space or structure. The project became more precise also via different kinds of drawings like the saxonometry and other major adaptions of the model. Here the same model, focusing on the interior. You see the different figures within the space, two new staircases, one here, one here. Two new, uh, the new floor with a little platform reaching into this big space as a kind of viewing point. Floor this viewing point, and a new oven. And again, the dormers a bit further developed. The one facing the front yard, this one, in the middle axis of the barn, another big one facing the garden, this one, at the very end of the barn volume, and a small one creating a space for a shower. And last but not least, you can see the new extension which had to replace the old one for the big space facing the garden. And the model in, it, in the context, left in the front yard, showing the three new windows cut into the existing wall. The entrance here, this will be the entrance in reality and the central dormer letting light into the floor and giving the new part its own point of gravity. The right-hand image showing the model in the garden, showing the relationship between the existing and the old. The model was our central tool until the budget was cut half. It was also a tool to communicate with the clients. These photographs were meant to give the client an impression about the materiality. And instead of adapting the model again, just to represent something we as architects were able to imagine, we made these photographs on site. An improvised communication we saved time with. After this model shots of Berg, of Berg 1, we had to rethink the entire project fundamentally since the budget was cut half.
And it's not easy to get rid of ideas and think something new. We struggled a lot and needed some time to do so. But there was no other option than reducing the intensity of intervention while keeping the main program, which was a requirement of the remaining client. It took a while until we were able to find another strategy, but we found one, we think. Some important parameters were, as I said, drastically reducing the volume of the newly built space and touching the existing just where it's urgently needed. This led to a structure which attached to the, to the existing dwelling, yeah. but then find its way through the barn towards the garden. In contrast to the punctual structure of the existing barn, we try to work as much as possible with the element of the wall, i.e. the timber board. And since it had to be very cheap and we wanted to avoid surprises while touching the existing, we deliberately worked with the topic of the distance, the tolerance space. And this space between the given and the new was not only because of more economic building processes, we read them as usable and positive spaces. So actually, the size of the project does not very much differ from the first version. We just include the so-called rest into the spatial concept. This is the final drawing of the ground floor. The new entrance via the old barn gate. After that, the vestibule, which is defined by the new and the old structure and opens the view towards the roof structure of the barn. One can still recognize the passage through the whole building from forecourt to the garden. And inside, there is then a connection to the existing entrance space in, of the old house. There is a new staircase with a storage space and a toilet below, pressed towards the old stone wall in order to leave as much space as possible for the passage. After that, there is a sequence of spaces diagonally leading to the garden room. And you can see here a post in the middle, which was isolated and became a kind of new center of gravity. And the relationship to the existing should also be visible in this drawing. Coming again from the new entrance, the new part starts with attaching to the old house. But soon it starts to emancipate itself towards the garden, where it almost stands independently, dedicating itself to the garden and the view. On the first floor, there is a connection to the existing house. Why this? existing gallery and little bathroom here. Again, trying to keep the space of the passage as big as possible, the bathroom had to be designed with a within a very small perimeter. The bathtub placed in a something similar to a bay window cantilevering into the space. At the moment, our client uses the two existing room here in combination with their newly built spaces. The rest of of the old house she rents out to a friend. Now I'll show you a series of sections which illustrate the relationship between new and old, or warm and cold interior spaces. The first one through the passage. You see the vestibule with its spatial relationship to the barn. The passage with a found timber wall and the freestanding post. This one and the transition to the garden room. Then through the middle of the barn, crossing the technical room and the garden room. Here's the former stable and the garden room. A very different relationship between both climate conditions, the warm and the cold. And finally, through the detached garden room next to the existing barn both defining a covered space, connecting the new addition to the workshop and the rest of the barn. In all three images, the butterfly roof was quite visible, I guess. 
it gave us the opportunity to define a precise facade relationship between the garden and the new building in height and length, while still connecting to the existing. And it also serves as a huge gutter leading the water in an underground tank from which it can be taken to water the plants in the kitchen garden. This is how it looked right after we finished it in 2020. On the left side, the entrance, like here, a part of the passage and the staircase leading to the upper floor. The right-hand image shows a, a bit the cantilevering bathroom and how it's connected to the found structure. We had to use cheap material in order to stay within the budget, so we worked mainly with simple insulated, insulated timber construction, which partly was prefabricated. We used a lot of CLT boards for the interior as part of an element or freestanding in a thicker version. And on the floor, we worked with a banal cement floor, which normally serves as an underlay for an additional finishing floor. We only sanded and treated it with a pigment stone oil. Here two details, detail view of the new floor with the post and its new base. This was a moment where the structure came down, so we had to lift it. And the conglomerate of elements at the outer wall of the bathroom. And here on the right side, you see the view from the entrance towards the garden room and the garden. And the newly built in part seen from the remaining bar barn. And here the intervention seen from the garden with the kitchen garden in the front and how it's connecting to the building, the existing barn. And in, here's got a glimpse of the materials we reused all the board boards from the building who stands there for the facade. And finally, two detail views also from the garden, showing the conglomerate of different parts and this small covered space in front of the garden room. Now I'll pass over. So now I come to the next project hall, or again a conversion. Similar to the last project, it extends dwelling into a given very predefined structure. This time not into a classical bar barn, rather into a modern barn, a very small scale industrial storage building. It is situated not so far away from the last project, also in the Alpine Rhine Valley, but a bit further north, close to the lake of constant to the bo uh, close to Germany already. Nevertheless, the context is different, less rural, rather suburban, at the edge of a small city called Dornbin in the west of Austria. I show now the project study we finished one half and a year ago, one year and a half ago. The project is ongoing, although there was a longer break. The circumstances are special, since we are part of the developers. It is a family project. Here the aspect of improvisation is strongly connected to the time we are able to spend on the project. And of course all the topics we described before about engaging with the existing. Although this is less complex than the situation at Aufberg, due to the more simple existing structure from the 70s we are engaging with. I start with some photographs of the current situation, but also with images showing the history of the building. The photographs on the left show the front building, which still looks more or less the same today. It is used to be attached to a similar kind of stable barn, like we saw in the project before. We can see it a bit here in the upper picture. Around 50 years ago, this stable barn collapsed. The barn was replaced by the building we see on the right side, a modest 
solid extension used for small-scale industrial activities as a workshop and storage of a construction company. In plan, the new building has almost the same footprint than the old stable ban barn had. On two side, sides, it stands on the border of today's property, here and here. I say today's property because originally the house with the old stable as well as the neighboring construction company belonged to the same family. Over the generations, the ownership structure has changed. On one side, the barn is attached to, to the still existing residential building we have seen in the images before. A small part of the volume is also directly related to the house. And on the west side, it faces the garden of the existing house and defines a kind of a courtyard together with another small extension. Thus, the building is orientated primarily to the southeast, towards the former construction company and the industrial quarter. The main structure is quite intact except for the roof, which is in a very bad shape and needs to be structurally supported, actually in a quite improvised way at the moment. Today, the larger part of the building is rented out to some car lovers. The smaller space here, it is used at the moment as a private wood workshop. These are the old plans. On the left, the original plans from the end of the 19th century, and on the right side, the drawings from the early 70s, which match the present situation of today. You can see that small part connecting with the existing house. The rest, basically, one big and one smaller space is orientated towards southeast with two big gates. This drawing is a bit misleading because those openings here are just windows as you can see in the section. And also in this elevation from the garden side. Now to the project. The main task was to create as many new apartments as possible within the attached hall, with total areas around 60 to 90 square meters. We had and we wanted to keep the existing buildings as much as possible, because if we would demolish it, we have to move away with the new building from the property borders due to the local building regulations. The project has to deal with different needs, which are not easy to, pl to pl apply to the found situation. The whole site is actually defined by the existing walls and everything has to fit in this so-called hortus coclusus. For housing, there's a strong demand for outdoor spaces in this suburban area. Ideally, they are orientated towards the south, in this case, towards the mountains, but also towards a difficult immediate context and access road to an industrial area. The existing garden on the other side, northwest, is in private use of the residents in the existing house and can only be peripherally included in the new project. And within the existing borders, we also had to create space for cars. One space per housing unit is mandatory. Since the edge is, defin is defined very clear, we try to work with a formal language for the new part, which is soft and flexible that could react under very different spatial requirements. We were inspired how the cars inhabit the simple box-like space today. But it should still be readable as one entity in the urban context acting as a counterpoint to the old house in its silhouette. This is how we approached the project. We worked here for a quite long time with the drawing, but then jumped back and forth between the model and the plan. At the top left, we see a floor plan, below that a section, both from an early stage. It quickly became clear that the mesonet typology made sense due to the existing walls and the small industrial neighborhood. All units should benefit from the different qualities of different floors. This is the latest version of the project in plan. On the left, 
the existing house, on the right the existing perimeter wall and the new fill in in red. After entering through the gates here, there is a courtyard. It is one hand the main entrance, but also contains space to park the cars below a roof. Programmatically, it is a hybrid space that, could, that should also be usable as an outer space connected to the main space inside. The large hall we divided in half and inserted two masonite apartments of different sizes. On the left, unit one, on the ground floor, there is a large main room with a kitchen, a living room, and along the wall below the staircase, a storage space and a toilet. This main room takes up the entire depth of the building. On the garden side, the new internal facade steps back from the existing wall and creates a loggia that extends into a balcony facing west to the existing garden. On the right, unit two, although we have more facade area here, we are limited due to the closeness to the neighboring houses. To meet the desired privacy for both sides, we just kept the horizontal openings, which are placed very high within the existing wall. That is why the walls in this drawing are filled with black. Accordingly, the ground floor is almost four meters high. We thought of a combination of living and working in the sense of a studio where you can also sleep. The kitchen and toilet with a shower are pushed towards the front. A round staircase then leads up to the upper stair, but also zones the big space in a more public and in a more private part. Here the upper floor. The unit on the left has two main rooms with a bathroom in the middle. From here, unit number one also has access to a large terrace facing southeast, the roof above the car parking. On the right, the staircase leads to another roof terrace for the second unit. Here is a section where you can see the new together with the existing house. Our aim was that both parts have their own center, but still work together as an ensemble. You can see the high leveled existing windows in relation to the main space of unit two. And you see the different room heights and terrace levels. The narrow part on the left here was intended as a service wing in this stage of the project with storage rooms and space for laundry. In the second section, you can see how a part of the volume is still connected to the old house. The lower room is a side entrance that leads to the courtyard and garden. The main entrance is here in the front, connecting to the main street. Up, um, upstairs is a laundry room. This dependency again creates a new level of roof in our project. Finally, some model pictures which show another step in the design compared to the drawings. In particular, we have further developed the roof in the middle part of the extension. This part is sticking out from the given boundaries and does contribute to the figure of the new ensemble. Compared to the very specific geometries we used to react on the challenges in the belly of the extension, the top part and especially the roof on it reacts on a bigger urban context as well. It is regularly folded and perfectly orientated to host solar panels. Again, brief, briefly for your orientation, here the old house, the roof of the old house, the existing wall, our frame. Here these parts belong to the old house. Here the roof terrace of the smaller unit the roof above the parking and the two courtyards with the access from this, this industrial quarter. Here a frontal model image on the entrance side. The old house and the converted and extended hall co coexist. It is no longer the house with a low extension but 
two equal individual buildings next to each other creating an ensemble. The existing gates remain, but we added one more with an integrated door here and another formally isolated door to access the courtyard and the extension and to symbolize the new use. Here a model image showing the garden side, the back entrance to the existing house here, with the, lawn, the windows of the laundry space up there. The only change in this facade, in this existing wall, is the balcony with the new big opening above the already existing horizontal window, and further above, similar to the other side, the new part reaching out of the existing. And as a final image for this project, a bird eyes view of it. Now I come to the third project. The third project we are showing today is a competition entry that we unfortunately did not win, but at least we got a prize. We developed the project together with the Zurich-based office El Bilitsky. The task was to incorporate various rather public spaces of a school into a neighboring church. The church and the school are situated quite central in the city of Zurich on one of the hills facing southwest. The program was a library, a multifunctional hall, and rooms where the kids have lunch and do their homework, as well as the related adjoining rooms. Here are a few pictures of the church and its surroundings as it looks today. There is a Wonderful view on the city from the front yard of the church, which is a kind of peaceful plateau surrounded by trees and is connected to the main entrance. But the problem is, since the early 70s, one of the busiest and loudest traffic routes of Zurich passes by the church. This is the main entrance and here a side entrance as well as the church as a whole from the back. A few pictures from the interior. The church has not been used as a church since 2019. When those photos were taken, the space was used by the activist group Klimajugend, the climate use. Here we see the plans of the church built at the beginning of the 20th century. It was built for the Evangelical Reformed Church. It is considered to be a typical representative of a Reformed Church architecture at the turn of the century. The floor plan organization is very simple. There is a nave and a transept. In three of the four corners, staircases leading up to a gallery, the staircase at the bottom right also leads to the bell tower. Here the church in a longitudinal and a cross section. With this, you get an idea of the spatial quality of the main room, including the gallery and the space below it. The space below the gallery, as we can see very good in this cross section, is quite compressed. Whereas on the gallery, you are within the main church space, close to the walls and the light that enters to the church through the large stained glass windows. This section shows the back gallery here above the main entrance, the elevation of the big window I just mentioned, within the niche of the side galleries, and the outdoor space with an organ here where the walls goes down lower in section. I come back to this later because the precise volumetric conditions of the interior are quite crucial for our design. Now a few words about the brief and the program, which was not easy to fit into the church, but we took it very seriously and also as a challenge. There is a significant shortage of school space in the city of Zurich, and on the other hand, the churches are empty. Of course, not everything should be in a former church building, but we very agreed with the program of education and care. Thus, we have tried not to cut corners in the implementation of it. We also trusted the organizers of the competition. In its preparation were involved, among others, the city, the school, the Reformed Church, and the monument preservation. And the brief was also based on a feasibility study, which seemed carefully carried out. We got a detailed list of 
all new spaces, the relationships between them, their sizes, minimum floor to ceiling heights and a lot of other parameters we had to take on board. There was a requirement from the Monument Preservation authorities that the built-in construction must be reversible without causing lasting damage to the protected church. We agree with this. The brief also started that the church should remain perceptible as a whole, whatever that means, together with the necessity of including new program. The church's decision, however, showed us that there were obviously two positions in the selection committee. The one that put the program to use in the center, so the school, and those who gave higher priority to the church as a building. The second position prevailed, but with the consequence that the users, the children and teachers, have to make concessions in daily life. Now I come to the project and I start with the process behind it. As already mentioned, we had, a great, we had great partners to work on this competition. Elena Erl and Tibor Bilitsky from El Bilitsky Architects, also from Zurich. This collaboration naturally brought a new complexity to the process, which was challenging but very inspiring and fruitful. New instruments were added that we had not mastered to the same extent until then. And, commun and communication was also an issue that brought new facets to the process. We allowed ourselves a long phase of improvisation to get closer to an attitude and intention and consequently also to a spatial and formal idea. At the beginning we asked ourselves how space it should be for kids where they have lunch and do their homework, but also where they just be and spend their unscheduled time, in some cases more time than at home. As mentioned, we have not taken the perspective of the church or the building preservation, which emphasizes the value of the cultural heritage, rather that of the school, which perhaps stands for the smooth running of daily life. But what we really were interested in was the children's perspective. And we had our doubts that the spiritually charged space like the church would be suitable for the program. Thus we put the demand, the church has to be perceptible as a whole, back in our priority list. Instead, we formulated an idea that would reduce the fear of contact with this spiritual context. For instance, we talked about one goal of our project would be to allow people to touch the walls. So the elephant of Coney Island is somehow emblematic for our concept. It is about a clear figure from outside and a dense and complex conglomerate of spaces inside who have their own demands. As often in our project, we were also very interested in those spaces in between, the rest spaces in a positive sense. They always have the big potential to create a great tension. Now to our final proposal. Here we see the ground floor drawing. Our in intervention is drawn in blue. Up here, would be the existing school complex, which is now outsourcing some uses to this church. Today, churches have often lost its importance as a meeting place within a neighborhood, while the school with its outdoor spaces takes over this task almost by chance. Therefore, we have kept all the three existing entrances, one, two, and the main entrance here, to maintain the link to the neighborhood. And the spaces inside the church are arranged in such a way that a wide public can walk through it and use it since all entrances lead to a common intermediate space. The specific areas are then accessible from there. In the middle is the lunch area, which is directly connected to the spaces for after school care. In this niche is the, the kitchen where only the dishes are washed as the food is prepared in the school kitchen and brought in here. And in the other niche are two group rooms for special lessons or meetings. The upper floor is reached by the existing staircases and a new elevator here. Here you see the upper floor. The library is on the left and the hall for little concerts and choral singing on the right. This newly installed floor is higher than the lowest level of the gallery, as we can see better in the section I show in a moment. 
On the one hand, we wanted a higher room height on the ground floor level. On the other hand, we were looking for a vertical spatial relation in order to make the church space perceptible as fragments in as many situations as possible. With this layout of the uses, we have fulfilled the required program. But this arrangement also creates a lot of spaces <coughs> in between that can and should stimulate the children's sense of discovery. In that sense, the spaces in between, which are sometimes wide, sometimes very narrow, sometimes high and sometimes low, represent the core of our project. We hope that with this spatial experience, the children would be able to break out of the atmosphere of usually standardized cool rooms and always also homes. This space in between seemed like the perfect playground, but also study space and room for unexpected encounters. Here you can see the project in the section. The new level stand on pillars that we imagine as lacquered tree trunks, not so visible maybe here. We see that the new level once again creates spaces in between where children can hide and we see how we deal with the existing walls. We reacted to the different spatial condi conditions with different heights of the new volume. There are situations where the existing structure and our intervention almost touch, like here, for example. In this section, we see the, the foyer and the adjoining lunchroom. The glazing can be opened generously so that the whole area is usable when temp temperature within the unheated zone allows it. In the sense of a meeting place for the neighborhood over other events can also be organized within this generous ground floor. On the upper floor, the side galleries have a high spatial quality. They serve as a kind of playground in everyday life, as a foyer for events in the hall, but also as an extended classroom or library. In the cross section, one can see the position of the upper level, which creates a vertical spatial link through a distance of the new component to the existing balustrades of the gallery. The galleries are then connected to the newly installed rooms via stairs. During the process, we also worked with a model to understand the special complexity and the different light conditions. As already mentioned, we were interested in almost touching the world and in the variety of spaces between the two structures. We believe that this picture shows perfectly the density and our de desired tension between the old and the new. Here are two more close-ups, one with the two upper rooms in focus, the library and the hall. And on the right, the ground floor with the columns pushing up the volume and the visual relationship with the gallery niches. <laughs> Here we now see two axonometric representation of our structure. Everything is designed as a wooden structure. When they're mentioning the individual elements, the building process also had to be taken into account. Since everything would have had to be transported into the church via the existing openings. Basically, the structure consists of two volumes with an intermediate part. In the detailed design, however, we added slight shifts that react to the particular spatial situations. For example, here, where the spatial relation to the ground floor should be emphasized. On the left here you see our built-in structure with all its layered isolated and on the right together with the church. Close to the big windows, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis to this circular one, we have reacted with full surface glazing in order to bring the maximum light into the new spaces. While in other situations, closed surfaces provide the necess necessary comfort or allow to furnish the spaces. And it also supports the idea of a variety of room atmospheres. For economic and ecological reasons, it also seemed to make sense not to glaze everything. With our intervention, we were looking for an architectural <coughs> independence from the church, also in order to do justice to the new use. 
We tried massively charge, massively charge the existing space, yet with res respect for the existing building. We touch it where it is really necessary, and the whole structure is demountable. Here, last but not least, two visualizations left of the ground floor with the new columns and the large scale glazing, as well as the spatial relation, relationship to the upper floor. In this area, the main entrance with the three doors. And on the right, there would be the niche with the kitchen. And on the right side, this picture, we see the view on the structure from a side gallery the library in blue and the hall in red. We see how the gallery and the new spaces are connected with a few steps. So now we are at the end of our presentation. We thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to an inspiring conversation with Hugh Strange and you and we thank you.